Here's the story that uh, Ron Wyatt told me before he died. I sat in his living room and talked to him for three hours about the Ark of the Covenant. He said, Brother Hovind, I, I, I found the Ark of the Covenant. I said, yeah, right. Okay, and I'm Methuselah. I'm still around. <laughs> he said, no, Brother Hovind, I really did. I said, well, tell me about it, Ron. Now, Ron was a great guy. He was the kind of guy that if I was God, I would let him find all these things because he wasn't out for any glory. He's not bragging about it. He wasn't, you know, not looking for money. Just wanted to... Hum He's a humble servant of the Lord. He had a lot of... Uh, Seventh-day Adventist teaching in him, which I would disagree with, uh, some of the things they teach. He wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist, but he believed some of the things they believe. Okay? Um, he said, I was walking along the north side of Jerusalem and with an a Israeli friend of mine, and we're walking along, uh, talking about things, and you know what happened here, what happened here. Because Ron's been a student of Scripture for many, many years, okay? and knew it extremely well. He said, we're walking along. All of a sudden, my left arm stuck out, and I pointed to this, this garbage dump. <clears throat> There's a pile of rubble been there for hundreds of years, you know, up against the side of this cliff. And there's a road along the bottom. There's a big cliff and, you know, another plateau on top. He said, my left arm stuck out, and my mouth started speaking. And my mouth said, that's Jeremiah's grotto, the Ark of the Covenant's down there. And his friend that was with him said, what did you say? He said, I think I just said, that's Jeremiah's grotto in the Ark of the Covenants down there. The guy said, well, great, let's dig it out. He said, Ron said, no, I've got to go home and look at the scriptures and make sure this is possible. I said, I don't know about this. So he went home and searched all the scriptures. He found out the Ark never left Jerusalem, at least it's never told that it left Jerusalem, and it didn't come back. All of a sudden, it just kind of quietly disappeared during the days of Jeremiah. The Ark is mentioned up until that point, but it's just gone from, from uh, the scriptures. Never mentioned again. Now, let's look at Second Chronicles chapter 26. <clears throat> King Uzziah prepared for them throughout all the host shields and spears and helmets and harbor guns and bows and slings to cast stones. And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones. So Uzziah made catapults going to fling big stones. These things are on the walls in Jerusalem. Here the Bible tells us that King Uzziah made these. Well, a couple of hundred years later, Nebuchadnezzar comes to take over Jerusalem. He doesn't want his guys walking up to the wall because these guys got these huge machines on top that fling stones. Catapults. Uzziah made these catapults to fling big stones. So they would, of course, have some kind of maximum range. I mean, you couldn't fling them forever. So apparently, Nebuchadnezzar built a wall outside the range of these catapults. Object is to starve the people out, a siege. It's, you know, you go, you camp around, nobody comes in, nobody goes out, eventually they run out of food. And so they built a wall outside the city wall. Jerusalem already had a city wall. They back up a few hundred yards or whatever the maximum range was, build another wall, Nebuchadnezzar did. Inside these two is called no man's land. Catapults can't fling the rocks quite far enough to hit the new wall, and nobody can get through to bring you any more food, so it's just a matter of time till you're starving. After you've eaten all the food, then you eat all the horses and all the cows, and then the rats, and then the, you know, then you surrender. Maybe. So Ron said he figures that Jeremiah knew they were going to lose. The king was not listening to God's word. God said, surrender. They wouldn't surrender. Nebuchadnezzar is going to take over. Jeremiah said, well, I better hide the ark and some of the temple furniture. So he thinks um, Jeremiah took the ark of the covenant, the table of showbread, some of the important temple furniture, took it out at night in between these two walls, outside the city wall, but inside the siege wall, and took it into one of a, a cave area. And there's caves all over there. It's like honeycomb, this area, that, you know, little tunnels and big tunnels, and you crawl around and get lost and they never find you. He took it back in one of these and then built a false wall in front of it. And Jeremiah and everybody else went off into captivity. And apparently he died there and didn't get a chance to tell anybody where it was. Or, for whatever reason, people lost track of where it was. And for 2,600 years, nobody knew where the Ark of the Covenant was. Ron is spends the next eight years, I believe he said, digging through this garbage dump, moving mountains of rubble, been accumulating for 
hundreds of years. He said, as they're digging, now, there's, a, there's a, a wall and then a flat place where the road was and a bunch of junk piled up against it. So they're digging and moving all this junk for, he said, he went over there as much time as he could spare for, a, I think he said eight years. Okay. He and his sons, and he would hire a neighbor, you know, people over there, you know, pay them to come work moving all this junk. As they moved the pile down lower and lower, they came to uh, three squares cut into the rock, into the side of this cliff. Obviously chiseled in by somebody, a couple inches deep, just recessed. He thought, now that is strange. What is this? Three, three of them. Kept digging down farther and farther through the junk. And they came to a little ledge sticking out, solid rock, with a square hole in it. And there was kind of a, uh, a truncated pyramid shape stuck in the hole. So he pulls this rock out, and there's a square hole about two and a half feet deep. Somebody's chiseled this into the rock. He said, yeah, Brother Hovind, here's the plug I took out. He goes over, and he's using it for a doorstop in his house up in Nashville. He said, this is the plug I took out. Apparently, this hole was to put a cross in to crucify somebody. And they would keep, when they're not using it, they stick the, they stick the plug in the hole to keep dirt out of the hole. Right above this were the three things set into the rock. He said, I think that's where they put the signs in three languages, what the guy's being crucified for, what his crime was. He said, we kept moving more junk out of the way, and we found three more holes down a little lower. So they had a ledge where the important criminal was crucified, and then three more, you know, one on each side and one straight in front. He said, apparently they were set up, they could crucify a max of four at a time. He said, while we're digging through this, we also found, a, he said, it was really strange, we found a, all of a sudden we hit a layer of a whole bunch of rocks about the size of hard balls, baseballs. Hundreds and hundreds of these rocks. And then we began finding all sorts of fragments of finger bones. Bones of people's fingers. Little slivers. He said, I work at the hospital. You know, he's a nurse anesthesiologist. He said, I began, I recognized him right away. I said, these are finger bones. What are they doing here? And he said, man, I bet this is where they stoned people to death. Everybody's throwing rocks at you. What are you going to do? Put your hands up to cover your face. It's going to smack your fingers right off. So he said he's digging along, and he notices from this one hole up, up on the ledge, the one by itself, there's a crack in the solid rock. He said it's this huge solid rock slab, and there's a crack right in the middle. So I thought that was kind of strange, about a half inch wide, just a little, you know, a little crack, but you know, a real long crack, running straight off from the foot of this square hole. He said, we didn't think anything of it. We're over there digging and digging and, you know, spending weeks and months and after several years of digging over there. They find this cave system, which goes everywhere. Here's a picture of Ron going into some of the caves. He said, many of these holes you have to breathe out in order to squeeze through. I mean, it's that tight. He said, we're digging and exposing these things all over the place, and we find this little cave, and we squeeze in and find out there's nothing there, so you go back out and find, you know. He said, we're exploring all these caves. He said, all of a sudden, one of my Arab friends came out through one of these little holes, and he said, I quit, and took off. He didn't even give me, give me a chance to explain why. He just said, I quit. <laughs> it's sort of like the cave crawler, only all rock. Nobody to, no way to rescue you, okay? <laughs> that cave crawler we did up at the Sequoia Cave. Or, uh, cave. Hmm? In Alabama. Childersburg, Alabama. Oh, anyway. Um, the Soto Caverns, thank you. Okay. So Ron squeezes into this area, and it op he squeezes through and opens up into a bigger room. And he said he's looking around in here with his flashlight, and he sees a little gold glint, you know, flash back at him. So he goes over and he, you know, dusts this thing off, and there's the table of showbread. He thinks it's the table of showbread. You know, a little table, a little smaller than this, all gold. And he said, and he looked back in this one end area, and he could see this on the far right side, the upper picture is what he, is a picture that he drew. He said, it looked like a, a box made out of solid rock. Somebody had taken this big rock and hollowed out the middle, chiseled out the middle, and put a, a solid rock lid on top of it. He said, but it was real close to the ceiling, and he said, I couldn't get my head over the top to see what's in the box. But the lid had been cracked, and part of it was moved away. And right above the crack in the lid was a crack in the ceiling. 
And he said, we finally did a bunch of measurements and figured out that crack in the ceiling goes straight up to the crack that we found earlier up above from this where the cross was. He says, I think Jesus, when he died on the cross, the Bible says the rocks rent, and his blood ran right down through that crack, right onto the Ark of the Covenant, which was inside right below him in 15 or 20 feet of rock. I mean, that sure preaches good. I don't know if it's true or not, right? But that's the story Ron told me. And some people really blast Ron Wyatt for all sorts of things. Well, he never, you know, they'll say, some of his finds were never documented. Well, that may be true, but that doesn't prove they're wrong. Not documented is not the same as proven wrong. <laughs> A vast difference, right? And he gets blasted all the time by these guys who, you know, one guy said, how can one, how can one man find so many things? I said, well, how much time do you spend over there? He said, none. I said, okay, well, then he's probably likely to find more than you. <laughs> you don't need to be a genius to figure that out. Um, but according to Ron, Jesus, when he was crucified uh, on the cross, and it's not even, you know, Golgotha that they show you when they go on the tours of Israel over there. They have this place up on top of a hill. He said, that's not it. He said, it's right here. It's garbage dump. So Ron says he found the place, the real place where Jesus was crucified, crucified and the real Ark of the Covenant. He said he finally did get to where he could move the concrete lid out of the way and look inside. And he said he thought about it long and hard before he touched it. He remembered the last guy that touched it, you know, Uzzah. <laughs> God struck him dead. But then he said, I'm a blood-bought, born-again Christian. Uzzah was only, his sins were covered, mine are cleansed. He opened it up, inside were the Ten Commandments. The bowl of manna wasn't there, and Aaron's walking stick wasn't there. Why? I don't know. They're never mentioned. Again, after the one time they mentioned that they were in there, apparently they rotted eventually and they threw them away. But um, that's his story. He says he didn't move it. He just went and told the Hebrew high priests or whoever, you know, the authorities, hey, I found the ark. Come with me. He showed it to them. They didn't touch it either. They still haven't touched it. It's still there. Nobody's moved it. He said he wouldn't make a big deal out of it because he didn't want to start World War III. He said, if you go around, hey, we got the Ark of the Covenant, if the average Jew finds this out, they're going to go tear down the Mosque of Omar because they want to build their temple real bad. You remember the guy that came here and played the harp on our back porch? He stopped in. He said, Brother Hovind, I saw your tapes. I love your ministry. Uh, and we get a lot of people stop in, you know, to visit us. And I said, well, what do you do? He said, well, I play the harp. He's a professional harpist, and he gave us a couple of CDs that he's made. It's just incredible harp music, you know. And he brought his harp on the back porch and set it up on the gazebo, and had we had all of our staff come in there while he played the harp for us. Gorgeous music. I said, Brother, uh, what do you know about the harps in Israel? He said, well, I'm helping them make the harps for the temple worship in Israel. Because, you know, in the Bible they had so many people that had harps, you know, they played in the, in the temple. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, I've been over there many times to Israel helping them make the harps to get ready for the, when they rebuild the temple. He said, they've got, I don't know, 30 or 40 or 50 of them made now, these harps, these little special harps they built. I said, well, have you talked to the high priests uh, about the Ark of the Covenant? He said, yeah, it's really strange. He said, they've been over there working like mad, getting ready to build their temple. They've got the harps ready. They've got the high priest garment ready. They've got, you know, the ashes of the red heifer, and he's naming all these things. He said, but when I mentioned to them, hey, what are you going to do about the Ark of the Covenant? They just smile and say, well, that's taken care of. He said, they won't talk about it. But Ron said, you know, with a, with a, a jackhammer and 30 minutes, you could knock a big hole in the wall over there and get that ark, just walk out with it. So apparently they're waiting until the temple's built. At the right time, they're going to go in there, take it out, and present it to the world. Anyway, Ron says the Ark of the Covenant is still there. It has two angels looking down at the mercy seat. The wings are touching, just like the Bible says. He thinks the blood of Christ ran right down onto the mercy seat. Now, I don't know, I can't verify any of this. But he said he took some of the, there was black stuff all over the ceiling and black stuff all over the mercy seat, dried blood. He took it back to the hospital where he works, or got somebody to analyze the dried blood, according to him. And they said, wow, this is human blood, it's pretty old, and it's kind of strange, it only has 23 chromosomes. That's what he said. Uzzah touched the ark and God killed him. So that's why the Jewish authorities have decided we're not going to touch this until we're real sure we got everything ready, okay? Not going to mess around with God anymore. 
So if you don't believe me, look at wyattmuseum.com, talk to Richard Reeves, uh, or talk to Nell Wyatt, Ron's wife. She can say, look, I knew him. I was married to him for years and years. He was a good, godly man. And I...